I have a confession to make. In the early 1990s, I suffered from a terrible addiction that took up my time, my friendships, and became one of the dominating forces in my life, taking me years to break free. I used people. I went places I would never go. And so I'm coming before you to tell you that I was a ray-tracing addict. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to William Hearn, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Looking back, it was probably inevitable that I was going to get addicted to ray tracing because ray tracing is an art that takes time. For someone who's never heard the term or maybe doesn't know that's what it's called, it's the using of an algorithm to simulate rays of light and make a scene look much more realistic than it otherwise might be just by freehand drawing it. If you know what you're doing and you set up the scene just right and aim the lights like they should, you can get a shockingly realistic image by doing this. If you squint and don't look at the seams, it can almost seem like a photo. The scenes that you create are usually done from geometric primitives, like spheres and squares and cubes, and from that you start to give it attributes involving light or fog or even aspects of the surface of things, declaring them some level of reflective or colored or having a texture that you're imitating. If you've grown up watching the progression of Pixar movies, this sort of thing should be pretty noticeable, starting out with pretty flat surfaces, followed by texture that almost looks real, followed by textures that prove to you it previously wasn't real at all, until finally you're competing with real movies and real photographs and even real camera lenses and movement to the point that you can't tell which is which other than you're seeing something which cannot exist in real life. My life has had many cases where a program has entered into it, and it includes ways to configure it and use it and tweak it, and suddenly I have something much more important, a creative tool, something I can add my own mark to and make even better. Without a doubt, I saw ray tracing-like scenes in the 1980s, far and away where I could touch them, just examples of how advanced computers could be when it came to graphics. In the early 1990s, I became aware of a program, and that program changed everything. It was called DKB Trace for the author, David K. Buck. It was basically a language. You would define a scene give it an origin point, and then write what amounted to a list of what triangles and planes and lights and surfaces would consist of. A bunch of directives, nothing like a 3D design program or anything like that. It was just you saying there's a square, and then maybe saying take a sphere's worth of volume out of that cube, then put a light above it that's red, that's aimed in this direction. Then make the cube that results from the previous volume reduction into something semi-reflective. Put it over a large square, except this square extends out in every direction and becomes a floor. Give that floor a checkerboard. Give that floor a reflectiveness. Then put a camera over here, aimed this way, and then show me what this all looks like. If this sounds like a recipe for trial and error, you'd be quite right, including the fact that rendering, creating a vision of what you had just described, could take overnight. I first used DKB Trace on my Amiga, and I have these very strong memories in college of making a primitive scene, leaving it rendering, and then coming back overnight and seeing just exactly what I'd created. Remember, a ray tracing program has to 
follow a beam of light all the way to the bitter end. It has to figure out what it bounced off, what it picked up, what the colors are, how it fades, to make everything as realistic as possible. This is a lot of calculation, especially for a microcomputer. So I would see the beginning of the drawing in the upper left as a series of dots slowly moving across the screen and becoming slower and faster depending on what was in that particular pixel. And there it would crawl, pixel by pixel, with me hoping that whatever came out the other end was worth seeing. When it didn't work, I had to look at the mess that came out the other end and try to figure out what exactly was going wrong. Did I move a triangle in the wrong place? Did I aim the camera properly? Did I put in a 5 instead of a point five when describing the reflectiveness of something? Where did I screw up? Once I figured it out, or put in an experimental number, that was another eight hours for that machine to tell me how it went. I loved my Amiga, but I was asking an awful lot of it. Luckily for me, DKB Trace became more and more complicated, took on more people who were working on it, and eventually it was renamed to POV Ray, Persistence of Vision Ray Tracer. POV Ray had a lot of advantages over DKB Trace. They'd redone the language to be clearer, to be more object-oriented, to allow you to declare a certain kind of primitive and then reuse it over and over again. It enabled me to make scenes that were far more complicated than my initial experiments. And there was one other aspect to it that made all the difference. They had ported it to a bunch of platforms. It wasn't just on Amiga anymore. And most importantly, it was on Unix. If I could get my hands on a machine that was compatible with POV Ray, I could compile it, give it the exact same configurations that I was using on my microcomputer, and render it on a computer many more times powerful than I'd ever dreamed. POV Ray came with a bunch of example files, all sorts of scenes involving architecture, nature, science fiction, so you could test things out really, really quickly. One of them was a Pac-Man scene with a Pac-Man with eyes eating dots that I found really compelling and which I started to use as my benchmark, because now I was on the hunt for Unix prompts. Whatever I could do to get my hands on a Unix machine somewhere, if I could tell net in, get my login, be a guest, download all of the POV Ray files, and then begin testing them, that made me happy. I remember I was in upstate New York, hanging around, waiting for a party to start that weekend, and there was a person who lived locally, who went by the name of Gandalf. And Gandalf took me to the computer room he was working at. And I quickly realized these all had guest accounts. They all were internet connected. And I could turn them all into rendering machines. So that's exactly what I did. I think there were 12 machines. I logged into all 12. And while talking to him on and off, I just started rendering on all of them rendering the Pac-Man scene, modifying it, rendering scenes of nature, seeing what that did, and most importantly, discovering that these machines could render in about 20 minutes something it would take me days to do at home. I never really figured out what Gandalf thought of this guy running around between all these machines, downloading a program and running it, but maybe it was something he was used to seeing because he never brought it up. I like to think he understood I was in the throes of an addiction. Looking back, I totally get what was going on here. I love creative tools, tools that give you all of the knobs and the tweaking that you can do and then let you see the output from it and then crumple it up, try another way, and see what the differences are. Creative mediums on the computer are what really drew me to them in the first place, whether it was a programming language, a word processor, a drawing program. This was a place that I could express myself non-destructively 
and be able to make things happen on them based on what I was imagining. It was, and continues to be, an irresistible feeling. Somewhere in the middle of all this, I got the idea to do a computer film. I want to stress how doomed I was in doing it. I'll explain the plot to you, in air quotes, and then talk about what happened. In my vision of this computer graphics short, we would have a supermarket with items on all the shelves, and you'd have two different sets of shopping carts with different colors on them, reenacting or at least referencing a scene from West Side Story. Two different gangs of shopping carts, on their own, having a gang fight, with some sort of resolution at the end. Looking back, I'm once again reminded at how prone I was to starting projects that had, built into them, no hope of success. There was nothing for me to work with in terms of character movement, tracks, working out cameras. It was all going to be on this text-based language. I wasn't even scripting back then. I would have to, by hand, create a whole new configuration file for each and every frame of this movie. True to form, I did launch into doing this. I worked on it for a few weeks, maybe a month, coming up with configuration files for supermarket shelves, putting products there, drawing graphics that could eventually be digitized and put on all of these surfaces, and working out what would be the ideal look for a shopping cart. Naturally, time, energy, and ability got in the way and they disappeared. It was only uh, about a year ago when a friend of mine, Tim Johnson, converted all of my old Amiga discs and I started looking at these outputted graphic files that I got to see them all with a completely outsider perspective. I'd had no idea what I was doing, but it looked a little bit like a supermarket and it looked a little bit like it was going to be something, but there was no way this was going to work out even though I'm glad I tried. It was fun to play with ray tracing. It was a fun couple of years to work on this, to track down computing power, to get my hands on processing that would allow me to do this. Over time, other things got my interest. The World Wide Web, creating HTML for web pages, and all of the allure of making tracker music and working in PostScript, and doing desktop publishing, and just playing around in a whole bunch of other realms that were clamoring for my attention. In the 20 years since I was a ray tracing fiend, I've watched that technology grow, not with jealousy, just with admiration. A few years ago, I attended the NVIDIA conference to attend a demo party that they were hosting, and I sat in on one or two of the talks that were being given especially the one that was being given by someone at Pixar. He was walking through the newest form of their animation system, and as somebody who had remembered working on all those text files that told a camera where to go, it was beautiful to see how advanced things had come. All of the computer rendering these days enables you to make a move in a 3D space and then have the system start immediately background rendering it, first roughly and then more and more detailed if you let it go, but then starting over again the minute you move a character. So you immediately get feedback as to where you're going, as to where the lights are, to see if your set dressing is working or if things are colliding into each other. It's basically instantaneous. You have this whole advantage for people who are artists first and computer people second to put something together that's really special. And if it's well written enough, there'll be a visual feast to accompany it. I realized, not with sadness, that in all of this, I'd missed the boat. It wasn't going to be where I put myself creatively going forward but I was delighted to find out that it existed. As for my old friend, POV Ray, it's still around, 
it's a little on the skids, and I feel like I might want to offer them bandwidth and space on the Internet Archive. But it's still there. Through the decades, they had competitions, themes, and a Hall of Fame that showed amazing work done in this very strange, very unusual programming language. There were support programs. There have been conversion programs. So you could create a 3D scene in a design program and then import it over and make POV Ray your rendering engine. Naturally, computers now are blisteringly fast, including with FPGAs, which enable people to make these scenes almost instantaneously render, light years away from when it would take me days and days to make a scene. Not every day, not every month, frankly, not every year. I'll swing by POV Ray and I'll walk those hallways. I'll look at those scenes which seemed almost photorealistic to me and feel like they're cartoons, but I'll see in them that hope, that belief that with enough programming, with enough concentration, with enough focus, I could have made a computer animated film with my bare hands and force of will. And that's a flood of memories I'm not ashamed to have. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to Forrest Fuqua, Mark Pilgrim, James Bekoyanu, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. The Persistence of Vision Ray Tracer, POV Ray, is still getting updates. You can find them at povray.org, where they mention it's been over 25 years since the domain was registered, and it shows all of the different twists and turns, triumphs and tragedies of that very special, very beloved ray tracer. If you don't hear from me for a while, I probably downloaded it again.